this talk. So uh, before we talk about anything in the title, let me give you the basic setup that we will be working with. So in this talk, the main object will be Boolean functions over the hypercube, where we think of the domain of the hypercube as a product space with the measure mu p, uh, which assigns each vector x probability equal to p to the number of ones in x times one minus p to the number of zeros in x. And we'll always have uh, be working with p which is at most half. And somewhat mentally, you should think of two regimes. One in which p is bounded away from zero, say p equals half. And the other one where p is a vanishing function of n. Say p is equal to one over root n. So the behavior in each regime is going to be very different. Uh, so once we have a Boolean function f, we can define various measures of interest uh, with it. So probably the most natural measure we can come up with is ask how much does it depend on each one of its inputs. So for each coordinate i, to measure how much f depends on the coordinate, we define the derivative, the discrete derivative of the function which is the difference between the value that f gets at the point x and the value that f gets at the point x when we flip the i-th bit. And then the effect of coordinate uh, i on the function, we define it to be the influence of coordinate i is the two norm of the derivative and it will be convenient for us to take it squared. And here, all norms have respect to the measure that we have, to the mu p measure. Uh, good. And the last thing I want to define is the total influence of the function, which is simply the sum of all influences. Uh, so now we come up to the central question of this talk. This is one question you can ask. There are uh, various related ones, but uh, this one is uh, simple. So here's the question. Suppose I give you a function f. Uh, I tell you that is, it is far from being constant, meaning it has some variance. And I also tell you that its total influence is small. It's constant, let's say at most 10. Uh, but to capture both of these regimes, and to write this condition as p times the total influence is at most k, what we think of that as constant. What can you tell me about the function in this case? So this is the basic question that we want to study. Uh, so why do we want to study this question? So this question appears naturally in several places in discrete mathematics. I'm only going to say some buzzwords uh, due to time constraints. Uh, so in TCS, it appears in PCPs and hardness of approximation. It also appears in external combinatorics. And uh, also in the study of sharp thresholds. Uh, so certainly there is some reason to study this question. Okay, so let's see what we can say about such functions. 
Uh, and let's begin with several examples. Uh, so how can we design a function that has a small total influence? So here is a very trivial example. Just define the function to depend only on its first coordinate. Right? Because then the influence of the first variable is 1. But for each other variable, the influence is 0. So this is uh, very simple. And slightly more generally, you can take actually any functions that depends on not too many variables. OK? And now we come to this question. Are the is this essentially the only example of functions that have small total influence? And here, the distinction between uh, p bounded away from 0 and p, which is little of 1, comes up. Uh, so the first result, which is a really important one, is due to Kankalai and Lineal. They show that any function uh, with these conditions there exists at least one variable that has large influence, meaning it resembles the first example. So for any such f, there exists a variable i whose influence is surprisingly high. And uh, quantitatively, it says that it's at least p to the k. So if we think of p as half and k as constant, it means that it has constant influence, which is a lot. Yeah, so you want it to be far from constant and have small influence. Because you can take constant functions, then nothing interesting is happening. Good. Uh, so, so this is a nice theorem, but it still doesn't give us like uh, what we wanted. It still doesn't tell us that the function only depends on constantly many variables. Uh, but this is in fact true, and this was sh uh, proved shortly after the KKL theorem by Friedot. Uh, so I'm going to be slightly informal, but again under the same hypothesis. Uh, Friedrich showed that not only is there a variable with large influence, but in fact, the function essentially depends on constantly many variables. So you should compare this theorem with the second example that we have. And if you look at uh, the quantitative bounds, it's different, but this actually turns out to be the proof. And this theorem is very effective when p is bounded away from 0. But when you take p, which is little of 1, say 1 over root n, it doesn't tell us anything, right? Because p to the minus k could be larger than n. And f depends on at most n variables. So one question is, still, what can we say about functions in the small p regime? Uh, but before I say that, let me tell you what is the key component in both of these theorems. And we finally get to this word, uh, hypercontractivity. So it goes as follows. Uh, so let rho be a parameter between 0 and 1 and consider a point x in the hypercube, we define the distribution of a raw correlated input with x in the following way. So 
y is rho correlated with x if for each i independently, we take yi to be equal to xi with probability rho. And otherwise, we resample it. Okay, so you should think about it as we have a point x. We sort of take a neighborhood of it, and this is uh, the set of raw correlated inputs with x. And now that we have uh, this definition, we can define an averaging operator that corresponds to it. Uh, so this is what we denote by t rho. So for each function, uh, the average function t rho is again a function on the cube. And we define it by t rho of f on the point x is the average over all y rho correlated with x. Of f of y. So good. Uh, so this is an averaging operator, and therefore it can only decrease norms. Namely, t rho is a contraction of any LQ norm. What hypercontraction says is that it is in fact stronger. So here is the hypercontractive theorem uh, for all p that is bounded away from zero, there exists rho that is bounded away from zero, such that t rho is actually a contraction from L4 to L2. This is really uh, the key component that goes into the proof of both the KKL theorem and Fritz's theorem. And the reason they become ineffective when p is small is exactly this condition. The rho that you get is only bounded away from zero when p is bounded away from zero. Otherwise, rho is very close to zero, and you do a lot of averaging. So it becomes kind of uh, constant. Uh, and, and this is actually the truth. You cannot prove something stronger because it's simply not true. And the examples that show that this is tight are, uh, for instance, uh, you take a function that is the end of, say, the first three bits of the input, or more generally, ors of such ends. Okay. Um, so, so still, this leaves some something to be desired, right? We have this inequality. We have very simple counterexamples that do not allow us to uh, have a stronger statement. And the question is, can we design a different statement uh, that generalizes this one is effective uh, whenever the function is not like that. And uh, the answer is yes, and this is precisely the new forms that I'm talking about. Uh, so this is the theorem. It's an joint work together with uh, Peter Kivash, Noam Lifshitz, Owen Long, and myself. Uh, so we proved that there exists Rho, uh, absolute constant, 
greater than zero such that for every f, uh, the four norm of the row of f to the fourth is at most the sum over all coalitions It's a weighted average of all coalitions of the effect that the coalition S has on the function F. And if you remember the derivatives that we defined at the beginning, this is precisely the derivative with respect to the set S of the function F. It's two norm to the fourth. Yeah. Uh, so just as a sanity check, uh, if you look at this inequality and you sort of pretend that any non-empty Fs, the derivative there is zero, or at least very small, then you can easily see that these two theorems are the same. So in fact, what we managed to do here is prove a version of the hyperconductive statement with error terms that depend on the der high order derivatives of the function. Um, so using this statement, we we can prove uh, several uh, things. Well, so we can prove an analog of the KKL theorem that improves the prior uh, result of Bourgain and some other things. Uh, but we are not able to uh, get a good uh, version of Friedot's theorem. So we still do not know how to prove strong structure for general functions, or at least for interesting enough. Uh, functions. Uh, so one last thing I, I want to say is that uh, this sort of inequality is not, not only unique to the bias cube, but rather you can have it for general product spaces and uh, a little bit beyond that. But, yeah, but that's all for now. Thanks. Thank